So welcome everybody. This is the almost the last event of the semester for the circus. Alan frequently will be giving a talk in two weeks. But today it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, you all to Jen Waltman Bourne's talk. Um, unfortunately, her husband is stuck in Europe uh, with the volcano clouds, so he's unable to be here, but he's hoping to get back soon. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have Jen here this year. Uh, she's here on, on, on route from UPenn to UCLA. Uh, she's a NSF Computing Innovation Fellow, and her research interests are in machine learning, um, in social networks, in computational aspects of economics, algorithms, um, very broad. She's received a lot of awards, including a dissertation award at Penn for um, innovative applications of computing, I believe. Um, and she's going to talk about some work she's done while she's been here with Yiling Chen and including work with other people. That is a great topic for circus is finding ways to aggregate information um, that's distributed over a, let's say, some kind of uh, network of some kind where the participants um, have distributed information. And we want to know what can we do in those kinds of settings. So welcome, Jen. I'm uh, sure we'll all learn a lot from your talk. Thanks. So I've been a little bit nervous about this talk just because I am generally very much opposed to including any kind of math or equations or anything like that in talks. And there's really no way to present this work without getting a little bit into the technical details. So um, I hope you'll bear with me. There are a couple of equations in this talk. Um, Luckily, it is a kind of small crowd today. So if you have any questions or if something I'm saying is not making sense, please just stop me at any time, because I would much rather that people understand. And I'm happy to skip the end of the talk if we don't get there. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some work that I've done here at Harvard with Yiling Chen. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about some older related work that we did also jointly with Lance Fortnow, Nicholas Lambert, and David Pennick. And this work is on connections between prediction markets and a particular machine learning setting called no regret learning. So let me start out by just giving you a general overview of what prediction markets are. Okay. So at the very highest level, a prediction market is just any financial market that's designed with the purpose of aggregating information from a population. Okay. So there are different types of markets, but in the type of prediction market that I'm going to be talking about throughout this talk, we're going to assume that there is some set of contracts, and traders are going to trade these contracts with each other or with a central market. And the thing that makes this a little bit special for this setting is that the payoff associated with these contracts is going to depend on the outcome of some future event. Okay. So for example, you might have a contract that pays off $1 if Sarah Palin formally announces she's going to run for president by a particular date. And this contract pays off $0 if this doesn't happen. This is the kind of thing that people like to bet on. And if you think about it, if you've got a risk-neutral better in this situation, so someone who wants to maximize their expected utility, then if this better thinks that the true probability that this event will happen is P, then the better should be willing to buy this contract at any price less than P dollars, because he thinks that with probability P, he'll get a dollar. And similarly, he should be willing to sell this contract for any price that's greater than P dollars. Okay? So in that way, for that reason, you can kind of think of the current price of one of these contracts as being a measure of how likely it is that the population as a whole thinks this event is going to happen. So um, throughout this talk, these prices for these contracts are really going to be um, our estimates of the probability that some event will happen. So let me give a couple of examples of prediction markets that um, have become popular. Um, the one example that people usually go to first is Intrade.com. This is a prediction market with real money that's run in Dublin. 
Um, so I went last night to see what the most popular currently traded um, contracts are in this market. And when you go there, you see a lot of things, a lot of contracts on things like current events. So here's a contract that just was created um, last week when it became clear that there was going to be a new Supreme Court justice um, betting on how likely it is that one particular um, candidate will become the next Supreme Court justice. Um, there are also some kind of current event political contracts that are popular that have been going on for much longer. So you can see here um, one of the most popular currently traded contracts is one for Republicans to control the House of Representatives in 2010. And this has been actively traded since sometime in 2009. So you can kind of see how the public opinion on this has changed over time by looking at how this price has changed. Um, there are also a lot of popular contracts on things like um, pop culture, things like this. So you can go and bet on who you think is going to win American Idol. And again, these prices and how they change over time are kind of giving us a good feeling for how the public as a whole, um, how likely it is that people think that this event's going to happen. Um, another example that gets a lot of publicity is the Iowa electronic market. Um, this is a, um, an academic run market that usually focuses on political events. So you can see here um, some prices evolving over time for uh, markets about who is going to win the popular vote in the 2008 presidential election. This, I don't know if you can see the dates at the bottom here, but on the left, it's going back to June 2006, and um, time is kind of moving here all the way up to when the election happened in 2008. Um, the blue line here is showing prices for a contract that would pay off if the Democratic candidate got the popular vote in the election, and the kind of red curve there is showing prices for the Republican candidate getting the popular vote. So this is kind of interesting because you know, this market's giving us a way to sort of track the public opinion of how this election is going to turn out over a period of a couple years. Okay. Um, one final example I wanted to mention is Inkling Markets, which is a company that actually provides prediction market software for um, software companies and other companies to use internally to make predictions about um, kind of how likely it is that, um, you know, things like um, a certain software product will be successful or, um, you know, in this example, will testing on some product complete in time, this kind of thing. And I don't know if you can really make out this picture, but they're kind of, um, their idea of how this should work in general for companies is that you should be able to create these kinds of markets about um, internal things, how likely it is products will succeed, and all different people in the company should be able to bet on them, and this should give you a really good idea of you know, what you should do, how you should um, plan strategies for your company, and this kind of thing. Um, Inkling Markets also runs some prediction markets on its own website about um, particular things that they as a company should do. So for example, they have a conditional market on their site that they did a while ago that said, you know, if we implement this new feature, will it be popular? And kind of based on public opinion that they gather through this market, they can decide whether or not they want to implement this new feature. So that's kind of the idea there. OK. so. You might wonder how good these predictions actually are. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work that says that you know, under certain very strong assumptions, um, these prices should converge to the right thing. Um, in particular, if you make some assumptions that everyone in your population has the same prior over what's going to happen, and everybody in your population is making these perfect um, Bayesian updates when they view everyone else betting in the market, and so on, then the prices should converge to what's called irrational expectations equilibrium. And the final price that you get should reflect kind of the whole collective knowledge of everyone in the population. Um, personally, I find the theoretical results here a little bit unsatisfying, because they break down as soon as any of these assumptions don't hold. So 
as soon as you have anyone in your population who's not rational, or as soon as you have anyone who's not making these updates in this particular way, all of the theoretical, um, all of the theory here breaks down. What's a little bit more convincing, I think, is that in practice there have been a ton of studies published that show that these prediction markets actually tend to work pretty well. So just to give a few examples, um, there is some work in the 80s that showed that if you look at orange juice futures, which you can think of as kind of a prediction market, um, the price of orange juice futures is actually more accurate at predicting the weather in Florida than weather forecasters on TV. Um, there have been a lot of studies that show, in many cases, election markets, like the one that I showed you earlier, are a lot more accurate, accurate than polls for predicting the outcome of an election, and so on. There are tons of examples like this. Um, So in practice, they're not doing anything to filter out these predictions. They're just looking at the actual price that you got to. Um, I'm sure that there are plenty of irrational predictions, because a lot of people are irrational. But <coughs> despite these people existing, it still seems to do the right thing overall. Um, you should kind of take these results with a grain of salt, because, you know, Probably there are also a lot of studies where prediction markets weren't as good, but people just didn't publish the results of these studies. But it does seem like there are a lot of cases where the predictions were pretty accurate. Uh, and just to drive that point home a little more, here is a graph that I stole from Inkling Market's websites that's showing how accurate their prediction markets tend to be in general. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the price of the stock at the end, which again is the basically the predicted probability. And on the y-axis, we have the frequency with which events that had that price occurred. So this um, green line there is just a straight line that shows what this frequency would be if all of their predictions were perfect. And the black line, just moving around a little, is showing kind of what um, how frequently these events actually did occur that had these predicted probabilities. So you can see that, at least for Inkling, it seems like their predictions generally are pretty accurate. So how do these markets actually work? So as I mentioned, we're going to have a set of contracts that are offered for every possible outcome of an event. So if we have a horse race, we might have many different horses, and we might have a set of contracts that each pay off $1 if and only if um, one particular horse wins the race. Okay? And it's important to keep in mind that these contracts need to go over the full set of outcomes. So these outcomes are all mutually exclusive and they're exhaustive They cover the whole space. Now there's going to be some mechanism here that determines exactly how these contracts are priced. And there are a bunch of different ways that you could think about doing this mechanism. So one thing that you could do is just use some kind of traditional stock market style pricing. You could do something like a continuous double auction, where you've got an order book and people can come and put in buy orders and sell orders for these contracts. And this is actually what Intrade.com does. Um, but there are some problems with this type of pricing for markets, which is that if you've got some market where you don't have a huge number of traders trading at all times, you're going to end up with really low liquidity here. And in fact, um, if you look at some of the contracts on Intrade that are not these most popularly traded contracts that I showed, you'll see huge spreads there. So it's very frequent to look on Intrade and see you know, something that you can buy for, you know, 80 cents for a dollar contract and sell for 50 cents, this kind of thing. So there are really huge spreads in a lot of cases. So one way that you can get around this problem is by instead using um, what I'm going to refer to as market maker pricing, where you actually have some centralized market maker who's going to be willing to always buy or sell contracts at some price with anyone. So it's always going to be the case that you can go to this market and buy any contract you want for some price that's going to be determined by the market maker. 
And again, the whole point of using a market maker like this is that it gets around this liquidity problem that you have using a traditional stock market style of pricing. Okay. So now when we have this market maker, the prices in the market are going to be determined by some cost function, which we call C. And you can think of this cost function as kind of a potential function. So in particular, this cost function is going to represent how much money has been collected by the market maker so far from trades. Okay. And now, if you let QI be the current number of contracts, which I'll sometimes call the number of shares, that have already been purchased for a particular outcome I, where an outcome in this case would be one of the particular horses winning the race, then the way that you're going to price another order is that if someone comes along and wants to purchase, say, X shares on outcome I, the amount they'll pay is this cost function evaluated at kind of the new vector of shares minus the cost function evaluated at the old vector of how many shares have been purchased, okay? So again, you can see this C is just kind of a potential function, and because this is the amount that the person's paying for buying X shares, the C really is just representing how much money the market maker has collected. Um, they frequently are, in all of the examples that people actually use, they're always convex. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, 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 and the yeah, so you can, so X can be negative. It, it's the same thing. Okay. And again, you can see that you can come up with different market maker mechanisms here basically just by choosing different um, forms of this cost function C. That will give you a new mechanism. Okay. So this is the basic idea of how the markets I'm going to be talking about work. So you might ask now, where are these predictions hiding in this market? Um, let me attempt to explain this. So here I'm showing just the cost function. Um, fixing the number of shares that have been purchased for all outcomes except outcome I. And on the x-axis here is just the number of shares for outcome I. Okay. So if you think about um, the current number of shares of outcome I that have been purchased being here, then this is the current value of the cost potential function. And now if someone wants to come along and purchase some small number of shares, the amount they're going to pay, again, is just this difference in the cost. So basically, the unit price of this purchase is going to be kind of the difference in the cost function over the number of shares that have been purchased. And you can kind of see then that the instantaneous price of purchasing kind of a very small number of shares is just going to be the derivative of this cost function with respect to um, the number of shares of Alchemy that have been purchased. Okay, does this make sense? So basically it's these derivatives or these um, prices here that are going to be our predictions of how likely it is that a particular outcome is going to occur. And again, just to really um, dwell on this point a little bit, you can also kind of think about the particular market in terms of just the price function on its own, and then the cost of your purchase of some number of shares is going to just be the um, kind of area under the curve when you're changing the number of shares. Hopefully this makes some sense. We should always be measuring here that the events are disjoint. They're, yeah, they're always or disjoint. Right, yep. So, related, I guess, for some cost functions, it won't be 
it's not necessarily, there may not be a point where, you know, an arbitrary Yeah, so you want to design your cost function so that that will happen. So you can have any. Yeah, and it turns out that the class of cost functions that we look at will always have that property where any set of probabilities. It, for some particular markets, you can't get a probability zero in any event, but any, or one, but anything in between zero and one you should be able to get. And do you worry about the, the size of the trade that a player has to do to move Yeah, that's definitely a concern, and um, it's kind of a black art right now to get these cost functions exactly right so that you can, you know, get a good. Okay. So we don't want to allow just any function for these cost functions. We need the function that we look at to satisfy at least a couple of um, basic, simple properties. Um, so the first property that we would like is we would like this cost function to be differentiable everywhere. And this is just going to ensure that our prices are going to be well-defined because, as I mentioned, the price is just the derivative of the cost function. So we'd really like that. Um, we want this function to be monotonic because we never want it to be the case that the prices are going to be negative. So that wouldn't really make any sense. We don't want it to be the case that you can make money by buying contracts. And the last property that we want is something called translation invariance. And essentially, this is just a property that's going to ensure that if you want to purchase K shares of every contract, the price of that should be exactly k. And um, it's kind of easy to see why you want this. If you think about someone coming and purchasing exactly one share of every contract, if the price of that was less than one, then they'd be guaranteed to make a profit because they would definitely get a dollar. And if the price of that was greater than one, they could sell and definitely make a profit because, you know, same thing. So. We always want it to be the case that if you're going to um, buy one share of everything, the price should be one. And if you take these three properties together, they're basically enough to ensure that the prices are always going to exist, first of all, and also that the prices are going to form a valid probability distribution over all of the outcomes. So these prices are always going to be positive, they're always going to sum to one over all of the outcomes. And Again, this is really good because we want these to represent probabilities over the outcomes. And there are a lot of other properties that are desirable for these cost functions, too. Um, we don't always get these from all cost functions, but these are things people care about. Um, first, we want high liquidity, which <coughs> essentially is just Again, this property that people should be able to go in and trade at any time and be able to do this at all times. Um, we really want it to be the case that the market maker has bounded worst case loss here because you know, nobody's ever going to be willing to run one of these markets if they can lose an infinite amount of money. So it's pretty important here that the market maker has bounded worst case loss. Um, we do assume that the market maker is willing to lose a small amount of money here and that's because the goal of these markets is basically to learn some information from the population. And you might need to lose a little bit of money to learn this information. But we're assuming that the market maker is willing to lose a little bit. Um, we want these markets to be incentive compatible, which essentially would mean that if um, that someone who's trading in this market should want to move the price to their true beliefs about the outcome because if we don't have this property, then we're basically not going to be able to learn anything. And we can usually get this at least myopically, which means that if someone's coming in this market and trading exactly once, and they're going to do it right now, then it's in their best interest to move the um, price to their true belief. It's a lot harder to get it to be the case that um, you still have incentive compatibility if people are allowed to trade many times and can do it whenever they want. 
And we also want this to be computationally tractable to calculate prices. And this is a point that I'll come back to towards the end of the talk. OK, and just to give you an example of one particular market that um, has received a lot of attention in the literature over the past few years, um, there's this market called the logarithmic market scoring rule, which was developed by an economist named Robin Hansen. And this market has this um, kind of exponential form of the cost function. It's not important to understand the exact details here. I just want to give an example of the type of cost function that people care about. And when you use this cost function, it turns out that the prices that you get also have this exponential form where the price is going to be proportional to e to the number of shares purchased. Um, this b here is just a parameter that kind of controls the liquidity in the market. And you can see here, again, that these prices are always going to be positive and sum to one, so no arbitrage is possible. So this is just an example of the type of market that people care about. And this one has been used a lot in practice in the past couple of years. OK, so now that I've given you this introduction to prediction markets, I'm going to change gears for a little while and talk about a different setting, um, which is the setting of learning from expert advice. This is a setting that's been studied in the machine learning literature for probably 50 years at this point. And there's been a lot of active research in this area. It's still like very actively studied now, despite the fact that it's been around for so long. So the basic setting here is that you've got an algorithm. And this algorithm is going to maintain a weight over a set of n experts. So here I'm depicting the experts as people, just because it seems natural to think of experts that way. But these experts can be um, learning algorithms. They can be features. They can be anything you want them to be, essentially. And the way that this is going to work is that at every step in time, the algorithm is first going to observe some instantaneous loss for each expert. So maybe the first expert here will have a loss of 0. The second expert will have a loss of 1. The last expert will have a loss somewhere in between. And then the algorithm is going to receive its own loss, which is going to be a weighted combination of the losses of these experts. Okay? And again, these are just the weights that are being maintained by the algorithm. And you can think about this loss that the algorithm is receiving as the loss that the algorithm would receive if it um, chose one of the experts to follow randomly according to um, this distribution. That's the weights. Um, it's kind of the expected loss that it would receive in that case. And once the expert, I mean, once the algorithm um, observes all of these losses and receives its own loss, it's going to select new weights for the experts for the next time step. So here, maybe because this first expert had a loss of zero, which is good, the algorithm is going to increase the weight on that expert. And the second one had a loss of one, so maybe the algorithm will decrease the weight on that expert. Okay? And that's the general idea here. And there's a classic result that goes back a long way here that says that in this setting, there are actually algorithms you can run um, that have the property that on ac absolutely any bounded sequence of losses for the experts, it'll be the case that the difference between the algorithm's cumulative loss, which is just the sum over all time steps of these weighted losses that I showed, and the loss of the expert that had the best performance in retrospect is going to be bounded by something that's order square root of t log n, where t is the number of time steps here, and n is the number of experts. So this is actually a pretty powerful and amazing result, if you think about it, because this holds even in a fully adversarial setting. So you don't have to make any statistical assumptions about where these losses are coming from at all. You just need to assume that they're bounded in some range. And you can actually get algorithms that will have a loss that scales like square root of t over t time step. So this is a pretty powerful result. 
Um, just some terminology, this difference between the algorithms, cumulative loss, and the loss of the best expert is usually called regret. And these algorithms are usually said to have no regret because the average regret per time step is going to zero as the number of time steps grows. Okay. And just to give you an example of one algorithm that actually achieves this guarantee, um, the most popular or common algorithm is the randomized weighted majority or hedge algorithm. And this algorithm does it by using this exponential form of weights where the weight that it puts on one expert is proportional to e to the loss of that expert times some parameter. Okay? So, Right, the weights are changing every time step. Mm -hmm. Right. And the um, big L here is the cumulative loss up to that time step also. So you're recalculating every step. So it seems to me that when practice Um, so I'm not talking about markets right now, but you do have to run this online and you do recalculate it every time step. But it's usually not a problem well, in practice. Not, so what you're calling uh, are the odds are fixed ahead of time? The set of experts is fixed ahead of time. Ahead of time. Oh. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, if you think about the form of these weights now, if you're paying attention earlier in the talk, it's actually kind of interesting because this equation here should look pretty familiar. And basically, this equation is of precisely the same form as these prices for the logarith logarithmic market scoring rule market that I mentioned earlier. Again here, this eta is just a parameter of the model, and this b is just a parameter of the model here. So essentially, if you, these weights and these prices are of the same mathematical form. And this was kind of the first thing that we noticed about these two settings that made us start wondering if there was actually some connection, if there was some relation between these two settings. So um, the goal in our work was basically to figure out if there was a relationship between these two settings and kind of how we can use this relationship to our advantage. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we basically set out to try to draw some analogy between this no regret learning setting and the prediction market setting that I was talking about earlier. So to make this analogy, we started by first equating the experts in this learning setting with the outcomes in the market setting. Um, this is kind of an important detail. I guess when we talk about this work with most people, they assume that the experts in the learning setting are going to relate to the traders in the market setting, but it's not the traders. The, the analogy is actually going to be between the experts in the learning setting and the outcomes in the market setting. Now in the learning setting, we're going to be maintaining the set of weights over all of the experts, whereas in the market setting, as I said, we maintain these prices over all of the outcomes at all times. In the learning setting, you can think of these weights as depending on the total cumulative loss of each expert up to the current time step. Whereas in the market setting, the prices typically depend on the total number of shares sold so far, which you can kind of write in the same form if you think about some number of shares being sold at every time step. And in the learning setting, what we care about, as I mentioned in these results, is the worst case regret, which is the difference between cumulative loss of the algorithm and the loss of the best expert. Whereas in the market setting, 
there are a couple things that we care about a lot, but one particular quantity that we care about is the worst case loss of the market maker, which is going to be the amount of, of money that the market maker collects from everybody minus the maximum number of shares that have been sold for any outcome, because this is essentially how much money the market maker is going to have to pay out if that outcome happens. Right? So it seems that to make this analogy, we're going to have to find some way to actually think about relating the loss of the algorithm in this setting to the um, amount of money that's collected by the market maker in the um, prediction market setting. And it turns out that you can do that. So um, the essential idea here is that we want to show that you can actually create a learning algorithm from any prediction market that has this cost function form. And you'll actually get nice properties for the learning algorithm based on properties that the prediction market has. Okay? And the way that we're going to do this is by basically coming up with a learning algorithm where we set the weights on each expert at time t to be the prices that you would have in this particular market if the number of shares of each outcome j that had been sold so far were equal to negative epsilon times the loss, the cumulative loss of expert J, where epsilon here is just a parameter of our model. So basically, we're going to come up with this learning algorithm that chooses its weights by kind of simulating a market. And the amount of shares that are going to have been sold in this simulated market are going to depend on um, the loss of each expert in the learning algorithm so far. Does that make sense? And it turns out that when you do this, we get exactly the property that we want, which is that the cumulative loss of the algorithm that uses weights in this way is going to be really close to the amount of money that was collected in this simulated market, or that would have been collected if we had actually run this simulated market. Um, it, we're going to basically set epsilon in a particular way. But, yeah. um, the losses are positive, so the Qs are negative. But that's okay. It's just like the market is always selling, and, or the market is always. Um, buying shares from traders instead of selling, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Basically, it's just the prices that you would get if the current Q vector was, yeah. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. really the setting of epsilon that's important. Let me have a picture here that might be helpful. If you're still confused about it afterwards, let me know. But um, the basic reason that these end up being close is if you go back to this picture I showed earlier, where you think about the price function here as a function of the number of shares of some outcome that have been purchased, 
as I explained earlier, the cost of this purchase, if you buy Q shares, is essentially going to be the area under this curve. And now, I'm being a little bit sloppy here and ignoring the epsilon, but if you think about trying to translate this idea to the learning setting, basically if we set the weight so that they have the same form as this price function, except they're going to be a, form, a function of kind of the negative cumulative loss, then if it's the case that the loss of this expert i at time t is the width of this bar, then basically the amount that the algorithm is going to lose because of that expert is going to be the loss of the expert times the weight that the algorithm put on that expert. So the amount that the algorithm loses is essentially going to be this rectangle here, whereas the cost that um, the amount of money that was collected by the market is going to be basically this area yeah. under the curve. So. The learning with experts is just an increased time right. spent, mm -hmm. whereas the um, price functions are are continuous and somehow. Right. That's essentially. Yeah. Right. So. I'm definitely glossing over some details here. I think it's kind of a complicated enough to explain without all the details, but the essential idea is just that, you know, if this, um, if this price function is kind of changing sufficiently slowly, and if we're kind of only, if we set epsilon in such a way so that this bar is not gonna be too thick, then essentially, the amount of money that's collected by the market maker will be close to the loss of the algorithm. Okay. And it turns out that by coming up with an algorithm in this way, we can actually get a very nice regret bound for this algorithm that ends up depending on just a couple of parameters of the prediction market that we start with. So in particular, we can get a bound that says that the cumulative regret of the resulting um, algorithm in the learning setting is going to be bounded by the square root of b phi t, where again, t is the number of time steps. Um, this b is a bound on the worst case loss of the market maker, which we need to assume that we have. And this phi is kind of a bound on how quickly these market prices are changing. So it's basically just a bound on the derivative of the prices. Okay. And so this is pretty interesting, we thought. Um, it has a couple of immediate consequences. So for one thing, if you think about this logarithmic market scoring rule that I mentioned earlier, it turns out if you do this transformation, you get exactly the weighted majority algorithm in the learning setting. And um, basically by plugging in the well-known bound on market maker loss for logarithmic market scoring rule and plugging in a bound on the derivatives of the price function, we can actually use this result to um, immediately re-derive the standard weighted majority regret bound, which is this square root of t log n. So, that's kind of interesting because it just gives us a kind of brand new way to drive this well-known result. Um, the other immediate consequence that um, was very intriguing to us is that this actually applies that any learning algorithm at all that you derive from a market in this way is going to be no regret because we've got the square root of t in the bound there. So as long as you have bounded loss for the market maker, any algorithm that you come up with here is going to be a no regret algorithm. So, yep. Can you the other direction? Um, I mean, that um, somehow the, the expert advice is a bigger literature and more likely to Yeah, say, yeah. So you can go in the other direction some of the time. Um, there are some problems with it. You need to make a lot more assumptions on the algorithm that you start with. Um, for example, a lot of times in the no regret literature, you have an algorithm where the weights don't just depend on cumulative loss, and you really need the weights to depend just on cumulative loss, that kind of thing. But if you make appropriate assumptions, you can go the other direction as well. 
Okay. So I'm going to get slightly more technical just for a second here. Hopefully you will bear with me again. Um, because of this last property here, um, we became very interested in figuring out kind of what the form of these algorithms that we're getting out are. Okay. Because we really wanted to know how it was that we were coming up with this whole class of algorithms that basically had the square root of t regret. Okay. So we found this representation theorem, which basically says that if you have any cost function that's valid in the sense I mentioned before, it just means it's differentiable and monotonic and has this translation variance property, and you furthermore assume that this cost function is convex, then you can actually write it in this particular form here. Um, form is not that important to understand, but you can basically just guarantee that any cost function at all can be written in this form for some function alpha. And this is basically just a proof that relies on some standard ideas from convex optimization. It's not that important. And furthermore, you can actually express this for any cost function at all as the prices that maximize this kind of inner expression here, again, for some alpha that's going to depend on the cost function. Okay. So what does this mean for us? Well, basically what I was saying on the previous slide is that for any cost function at all, the prices that you end up getting are going to be prices that maximize this form of expression, where this alpha depends on the cost function. And basically, this means that when we translate this um, prediction market into the learning setting, it's going to be the case that the weights that we get are weights that, max, that minimize this type of expression here. Um, now, if you look at this expression, this term on the left is basically just the empirical loss so far. This is just um, kind of what the algorithm's loss would have been if it had used these weights. And the term on the right is what's known in the machine learning literature as a regularizer. And this is essentially used to kind of add some stability to the predictions you're making. Because if you just chose weights to minimize this empirical loss, it turns out the weights you get would be really unstable. And basically, you'd always have all of your weights on one expert, and it would be changing very rapidly. So that's bad. So in the machine learning literature, it's really, free, it's really common to use some kind of regularizer like this for stability. And it turns out that there's actually been this whole body of work in the past couple of years um, on this class of algorithms called follow the regularized leader algorithms, which essentially are of exactly this form over here. So, it turns out that the set of algorithms that you get by making this kind of conversion are exactly this um, kind of well-known class of algorithms that have a lot of nice properties that people like. And furthermore, in this conversion, it's going to be the case, as I already mentioned, that this logarithmic market scoring rule corresponds to weighted majority. And it turns out that um, another very popular prediction market, the quadratic market scoring rule, is going to correspond to another very well-known learning algorithm, online gradient descent. So what's going on here? Well, um, our interpretation of this all is that essentially what these prediction markets are doing is really actually learning some kind of probability distribution over events by treating all of the trades that they see as losses. So really what's actually going on in these markets, which has been going on, but people didn't really think about it this way before, is that these markets are really kind of running these well-known learning algorithms that have these nice properties in order to come up with nice predictions about um, events. So. We're still kind of working to get better intuition for what all of this means, and um, it's definitely brought up a lot of questions, but 
we think this is essentially what's been going on with prediction markets, and we're trying to figure out you know, what this means still. Um, it also means that choosing which particular mechanism you want to use for a particular um, prediction market really just boils down to choosing an appropriate regularizer for your problem because any, predict any prediction market can be written in this regularization form. So basically choosing which market is essentially the same as choosing a good regularizer. And there's a lot of literature in the no regret community on choosing the right regularizer for a problem. So we're hoping that this will be useful in figuring out which prediction market to use for particular situations. Okay. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to mention um, one example of how we sort of applied this connection already. Um, and this is actually going to be earlier work that um, Yuling and I did with um, David Pennig, Lance Fortnow, and Nicholas Lambert before we fully understood this um, broader connection when we were just simply looking at the connection between this one market, the logarithmic market scoring rule, and weighted majority before we had kind of developed the rest of these results. And the setting that we are interested in is a setting where you want to price bets on some kind of combinatorial outcome space such as ranking. So the setting here is that suppose, again, you want to allow bets for something like a horse race, but now instead of just allowing people to bet on the horse who's going to win the race, you want to allow people to bet on the full ranking of horses or the full ranking of candidates in an election or the full ranking of something. And we're particularly interested in situations where the number of candidates or the number of horses is very large. So when it is the case that the number of candidates is large, you can't simply run something like the standard logarithmic market scoring rule because it's going to be the case that maintaining all of these different prices and maintaining just these quantity vectors is going to be intractable. Okay. And furthermore, it's going to be really hard for traders to bet in this market because it's really hard for people to reason about um, distributions over n factorial different outcomes. Okay, so we don't want to just run this market as is. So what people usually do in this situation is just run a bunch of separate and independent markets. So if you go to bet on a horse race, they usually have bets on horses to win, horses to race, horses to show, and so on. And these, are, these markets are run completely independently, even though it's clear that you know, if, if it's very likely for a horse to win a race, it should also be very likely for that horse to place. So would much rather have just one market that can take all of the bets so we can get a much better distribution, um, a much better you know, prediction by having everybody combine their information into one market. So the question that we were interested in here was, can we run an efficient, consistent combinatorial market over the entire outcome space? So the first thing that we did is restrict the betting language that people can do that people can use to make bets here. Um, so we just allowed two specific types of contracts in the market, and these contracts allow people to bet either on one candidate of their choice coming in a subset of positions of their choice, or a subset of the candidate coming in one position. So you could come up with a contract that pays off one dollar if a particular horse A finishes in either third or fourth place, or a contract that pays off one dollar if some subset of, one of some subset of horses finishes in first place, and so on. People can specify any contract of this form that they like. Um, the reason that we looked at this particular betting language is that there was previous work showing that if you look at call markets, which are more the stock market type of prediction market, then subset betting is actually tractable in that case. But it turns out that for logarithmic market scoring rule, you can show it's actually sharp p hard to compute prices, even if you restrict yourself to this betting language. So we decided to try to find a way to approximate these prices. And it 
turns out that this is where this connection that we had found originally just between the logarithmic market scoring rule and weighted majority came in handy. Um, I won't go into details here, but there is an algorithm that came out a couple of years ago by Hel Helmbold and Vermouth where they showed that you can extend the weighted majority algorithm into a setting where instead of trying to learn a distribution over just experts, you're trying to learn a distribution over permutations. And so, oops. Um, basically, we are able to import this permutation learning algorithm into the prediction market setting and show that basically by running this permutation learning algorithm, we are able to come up with approximations of the prices for subset bets. So this is one example where we were actually able to use this connection to take a result from the expert learning literature and import it to the prediction market literature to do something new there. And there are a couple of nice properties here. We have that, first of all, the prices are going to remain approximately consistent, which means that there is basically no room for arbitrage here. And we're also able to get a nice bound on the worst case market maker loss, which is b times n log n, where again, b here is just a parameter, um, and n is the number of horses or number of candidates. And this is a nice bound because this is actually the bound on market maker loss you would get if you ran um, kind of n markets independently, one for each um, placing in the ranking. So that's kind of nice. Um, I find this result pretty encouraging, and I'm hoping that we can find other ways in the future of taking results from one of these two literatures and importing them into the other. There's a lot of room for interesting work there. So just to quickly summarize, um, we're kind of excited about this idea that this long-standing old literature on theory of no regret learning can be used as a tool to understand what's going on in prediction markets and understand which prediction market mechanism should be used. Um, we basically have this interpretation that what's going on in cost function based prediction markets now is that they're essentially learning these distributions by tr treating observations as training data. And we think that this connection is going to be a powerful tool for taking algorithmic results from one of these communities and importing them into the other like we did in this permutation learning case. And there are a lot of open questions here. Um, there are a lot of kind of philosophical questions about how we should actually be interpreting this. We kind of have one interpretation, but we're not entirely clear it's the right way to be thinking about the problem still. And there are a lot of really interesting open questions about what other ways we can take results from one of these two literatures and use them to um, make progress in the other. All I wanted to talk about, I think we are going to get kicked out of this room very soon. But we will keep you in here until we can go as long as we want. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Um, go ahead. Um, so we haven't actually implemented any of this yet. Um, there has been, there have been many other papers where they um, implemented things like the logarithmic market scoring rule and um, reported on results where they um, had traders in some kind of lab setting and mostly those results were just looking at kind of the effects of changing the parameter in the market because there's one free parameter. Um, but we have not implemented anything here yet. Um, I mean, these algorithms themselves are very, very simple to implement. They're, um, I mean, the weighted majority, for example, just kind of a one-line update rule. So there's not really a big challenge for implementation there. I think the challenge in empirical work in the prediction market setting is mostly just finding um, good controlled ways that you can have people bet in markets that make sense. Um, it's kind of hard to come up with good lab experiments where 
you know, people do have some true belief about what's going to happen and, you know, are incentivized to bet in the right way. But the actual coding details of all of this are extremely simple and there aren't really any problems there. Um, so a lot of the markets that I mentioned at the beginning are not actually using a cost function based market. Um, in trade, it, which is probably the most popular market, is doing something more like a stock market where um, they have order books and all of that. and. Um, there, as I mentioned briefly, they do have this huge problem with liquidity, where it's OK for the most commonly traded contracts, but if you go and look at their long list of other contracts you can bet on, um, they're just huge spreads, and you don't really get much information from them if nobody's trading in the market. Um, Well, if you, if, you, if you bet on everything, you would bet on everything. Right. I guess, I mean, you could imagine adding something like a fee to bet in these markets so that the house would make money. But typically, it's just assumed in the prediction market literature that the goal of the person operating the market is not to make money. The goal is to actually learn something. So. I mean, this is, this is realistic if you think about something like these internal corporate prediction markets where their goal really is to learn something about um, how successful a product is going to be or whether people are going to finish a product in time and that kind of thing. You could imagine in that scenario, you know, the company's not trying to make money off this market. They really are trying to learn something. So 